My name's Captain Chris Myers. I run Central Florida Sight Fishing Charters. And it's like the name of my business. That's what this class is about. So this happens to be my favorite topic. Um, I think some of you have heard, heard some of this before, but maybe you pick up one or two new things every time you come. I appreciate you guys keep coming back and listening again and again. Um, but like Tom said, what I like to do is sight fishing. I really don't like fishing where I can't see that there's fish there, where I have to guess and wonder and hope that there's fish there. I like being able to see something before I start fishing or casting. Most of the time, I'm seeing either a fish in the water, I see a wave from the fish moving, I see a bait shower, and I see something that lets me know that there's a fish there. I'm not just randomly going to a spot and chucking something out and hoping that, hoping that I get a bite. because if, if you randomly cast around, you're going to randomly catch fish. If you throw to a target and you're consistently casting to, to a fish, you're going to consistently catch them. It's as simple as that. So if you're just guessing where they are, most of the time you're not going to be landed where a fish is. You know, if we can imagine that you guys are a school of fish and there's 15 or 20 fish and they were spread out throughout this this build. This, this building is a flat and you guys are spread out through around here and I just turned around, closed my eyes, and threw it out there, I have just as much chance of landing behind you, landing on top of you, not landing anywhere near you. What is the chance that I'm going to put this little tiny thing perfectly in front of you? And, and you can imagine the size of the fish, you know, compared just putting it by you. But imagine a fish that's two feet long. I'm going to perfectly put it in a spot that big by, by accident, by guessing. But most of the time, it's not going to happen. Can you catch fish blind cast? Absolutely. You can do it every day. But are you going to catch them? Can you catch more fish by seeing something and cast it to it? I think you can. And when you got clean water and you got sun, there's no reason you shouldn't be looking for the fish. Now, the most important thing is you have to be able to get close enough to the fish to see them. And by far, the number one thing I see stop people from catching fish on my boat. It might be tied with forecasting, but right up there is. A little squeak, just a little squeaky shoe, and that that isn't very loud. But on the deck in the morning, it's about ten times that loud. But even that little bitty squeak goes right through the deck of the boat, and before you even start moving your rod, those fish are already gone, or fish are gone that you never even saw were there. You see a big red fish push off, yeah, you see a, a wave, or you see a school of fish lift up. It's pretty obvious. But I've seen just thousands of gigantic trout swim away and not push any water at all. As they're swimming, they're just swimming away getting away from you. And if you're making noise before you got to them, you never even knew that fish was there. It was it just swam off nice and slow through the grass and never got to see it, never got a shot at it. So you gotta be quiet and you gotta make sure that your feet aren't making noise on the deck. People ask me a lot, can I what about talking? Does that bother them? The only time I see uh, talking bother the fish is on we have windy, you know, wind blowing a little bit and you know I'm 15 feet away from the people in front of the boat and they might have wind blowing in their ears and I have to yell. And I have seen on occasion what I have to yell real loud at 12 o'clock, you know, that I've seen fish maybe hear my voice. But normal talking, never seen it really bother So I don't worry about talking, I'm worried about noise on the deck of that boat. Little things like putting the rod, butt of that rod down. See, you know, a lot of times you put the rod down. People get, you know, you're going to get, if you're fishing on the flats, you're going to get grass on your rod. And to me, you know, this isn't some secret fishing trick, but I see it enough times that maybe somebody in this room does this. If you got grass on your rod, you do this, and you have to go and get the grass off. But every time you do that, you got to put the butt of the rod on the deck, and there's a chance the rod slips over and goes in the water. When if I got grass on my on my lure, I go like this, and now my rod doesn't have to dig. It's little tiny, simple little things like that that I see over and over and over. That you know, if you didn't put that rod on the deck, you know, the bad one, the guys that splash it in the water. Yep. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> or smack, or get the grass on it and smack it on the water to, to get the grass off. You know, that's just telling every fish for a couple hundred yards around something strange is going on. These fish are wild animals. Now, I'm guilty of saying it. I'm trying not to do it anymore because I don't think it's really true. I hear people say it all the time, and, yeah, Mosquito Lagoon, the fish are really spooky. Well, I don't think they're any more spooky than any other wild animal. I mean, where can you go? Tell me any anybody that knows where 
wild turkeys or deer that aren't used to seeing people or any other wild animal, you can walk up next to them and just hang out and they're just going to sit there and let you. There's no animal that does that. So why would we expect that when we're by, when we're in, even not even a boat, you know, a six foot tall person next to a two foot long fish and it's right there next to us, why it wouldn't be scared and run away? If you imagine something that much bigger than us, we're getting the heck out of there. We're not going to stick around and look at it. The fish are, they're just normal wild animals and you got to treat them like they're wild animals and they're not, you know, if you can get close enough to see them, it's not going to be very long before they see you. So they're not, it's not that these fish are real spooky because I don't know any place where you can go hang out by a bunch of, a bunch of fish and just sit on top of them and you don't, you know, in, on, anywhere on the flats. Now, that being said, are they a little more educated than other places? Yeah, they you go to Louisiana and and do things that you're probably not going to get away with here because our fish see boats every day. They're used to the sounds. You know, they, they know the sound of a trolling motor. They know the sound of your big motor. They know the sound of squeaky shoes on the deck. Where other places the fish might not see people as much and they might not you know, recognize that as danger as quickly. But here, you know, don't, don't, keep, don't get in the mindset that oh, these fish are really spooky. Treat them like they're a wild animal and you're, you're trying to hunt a wild animal and do what you would do if you were hunting in the woods. I get a lot of guys on the boat that they don't they might not fish much, they might have never been to the flats, but they're from parts of the country where they're they do a lot of hunting. Matter of fact, we had did a two boat trip today and my buddy had hunters on the boat. He gets all kind of noise. They said, you guys do that when you're in the woods and expect you're gonna see a deer. Never just sit perfectly still in that tree for hours on end, waiting for the animal to come by. But people get on the boat and just make tons and tons of noise and they don't even realize they're doing it. Because when you're in the woods, you're in that frame of mind, hey, I gotta be real quiet or I'm gonna scare everything away. But people think they're on that boat above the water and fish aren't really gonna know, but they do know, especially especially our our fish. They certainly do know and they certainly will be gone long before you get to them. So the most important thing is you have to be able to get next to them. Right after that is, if you're gonna sight fish, you gotta be able to see them. And if you don't have the right glasses, you're not gonna see the fish. Uh, lots of times, fish no farther away than from me to you, and people are telling me they don't see them. And I come down and look through your glasses, and I understand why they don't see them because I can hardly see them either. You got to have the right glasses. If you have gray glasses, I highly recommend you go out and get yourself a different color pair, and you'll find a whole new world out there to see. I mean, you can see fish with gray glasses, but you can see a heck of a lot better with a, a copper color, an amber color, a vermilion color. They, they bring out, they make colors more vibrant where gray makes everything dull. If you take gray in front of your face and hold it up and look around, all these colors aren't going to be as bright. We're looking for that little tiny bit of color sometimes. That's all you're going to see. There might be 200 fish there and you just see one little uh, one little red fin or one little blue strip of a tail and all of a sudden there's all the fish. And if you didn't have the right glasses, you miss it. For early in the day or a cloud cover or a little bit murky water, glasses are really going to help you see those fish. you got to have the right kind of glasses. They don't have to be $200 glasses, but they need to be the right color and they definitely have to be polarized. So we get by the fish and we're looking for the fish, but not only in the water, we're looking for differences in the pattern of the water. I call it like the fabric of the water. And I think that some people's brains, I don't care how good you can fish, I think this what some people's brains recognize patterns uh, differently than others. And sometimes I have a father and a son who might be a 12 year old kid, never fishing out there at all. And I'll say, you see those fish pushing? And he, he knows exactly where I'm talking about. His dad and all day long never see. Them. If there's any kind of, I mean, if it's slick calm, it's quite obvious, I think, to anybody when there's something moving. But it's when you got a little bit of breeze, but the wind only blows in one direction at a time. So if the wind's blowing left to right, all of those waves are set up in a pattern, pushing that way, and anything disturbing that pattern has to be something moving in that. And it's the ability to recognize those little bitty pushes or a little tiny fin sticking up out of the water that makes the difference between you casting that, seeing the target and being able to cast where those fish are, just pushing on by and never noticing they were there. I mean, I've been on the water dozens and dozens of times where schools of two or three hundred fish have went right by people's boats and they had absolutely no idea they were there. 
less than two feet of water. They might not have been paying attention, they didn't know what to look for, or they thought they were mullet. Question I get a lot, how do I tell they ever seen a mullet and a redfish? And you know, I've tried to think of a way to explain it. I, I, not really something that I think I can put into words, but it's something that once you see enough times where you see in the fish in the water so you're absolutely sure what it is and then you look at the pattern of the wave that it makes you pay close attention to what that water looks like as that thing moves then when you don't where you can't see say early in the morning you just see the wave you can say yeah, that's probably mullet or that's a red fish or that's black drum or that's a trout you know are you going to be right a hundred percent of the time no but I think I do a pretty good job of knowing what, what something is by the way it pushes the water because I pay attention when I can see that fish in the water. When, we're, when we can't <coughs> see in the water, I still want to have some kind of target. So I can always see a push, I can always see a fin if it's breaking the surface, and every cast that I make, I'm looking at something trying to hit it. Even if it's not a fish that's going to bite, I'm doing something, I'm practicing my casting accuracy. And the third most important thing when you're sight fishing flats is being able to hit your target. Because if you get close to them and you can see them but you can't hit them, then it all falls apart. Perfect example today. We didn't see a lot of fish today. I mean, I would classify it as a pretty poor day. But we did see some fish. The guy saw the fish but they didn't get it to So if you don't get a lot of shots in the day, and every day isn't gonna be paradise out there. You know, it just, the law of averages says, you go out there enough times, there's gonna be days where you don't see a whole lot. And if you're not prepared to make those shots count, so if, you're at, if your accuracy of hitting your target is only 10 or 20%, and you only see 20 fish that day, that means you only get shots, good shots of two fish the whole day. You know, if you, even if you saw 100 fish, you only got 20 good shots that whole day. But if your accuracy is 80 or 90 percent, you know, no one's going to be 100 percent. I don't hit 100 percent of my shots every single time. But I do a heck of a lot better than 20 percent because I practice a lot. So being able to hit that target and cast them, to me, is far more important, which is why I haven't even gotten to what you should use and what you should tie on here. Because if you can't accomplish those first three, it doesn't make a lick of difference what you have. Got on here. Another popular question I get: okay, You're going to have live bait? You got live shrimp? I could, but if you can't hit it with a plastic trip, you can't throw it in front of it with a live shrimp. You can't throw it. In, you can't throw the live bait in front of the fish. And the fish are over there, and you cast over here. You're still not going to catch them. It doesn't matter if it's alive or dead. So instead of worrying a lot about what you got tied on there, or what's the best color? I work a lot of fishing shows. I stand there sometime the whole weekend, get lots of questions. The most popular question is what's the best color? What's the best color? Everyone wants to know what's the best color. I got every almost every color they make. If I don't have it right now, I've used it. And I'm pretty confident that any one of you could just pick your favorite color and throw it up to me and I could go out tomorrow and catch a fish with it. Because the colors are catch you and me what we think looks really cool. Man, that's a brand new one. I got to try that one. You know, it looks good. Um, do, is there any, does anybody ever use the shrimp that looks this color? Or any shrimp that have chartreuse tails and red and white shrimp? But, you know, there's every single color shrimp out there. I've only seen a couple different color shrimp. They're kind of tannish brown or they're golden. You know, they don't really look like any of these things at all, but we all catch fish on them. Fish aren't used to seeing this. It's not what color this is, it's what are we putting it in the right place at the right time and making it do what it needs to do. Well, I do have my own personal favorites, but it's more of a style than it is color. Um, you know, I have a handful of colors that I use over and over just because you know, I think we all have that habit. But over the years, I you know I used to use nothing but uh, this color and then I changed to that color and now I use a lot of this because you know I've changed whatever I happen to have the most of at the time it always seems to work and I plenty of times I get one guy one color and one another and never seen them that made a whole lot of difference uh, I don't really worry about 
should I use the dark color and the dark water and the light color and clear water and it's cloudy use this color. I hear a lot of a lot of people too a lot of talk about that. I've tried it and I really don't see that makes a lot of difference. The difference is being able to put that thing in the right spot quickly and accurately and making it do what that made on it. So basically the only four things that I use sight fishing. I use shrimp, I use a little three inch paddle tail on a jig head like this. In the winter time I, I use this little crab and I use something like a jerk bait, either a big one or a little one. Other than that, it's not really a whole lot else that I use. But, you know, I don't need a big, huge selection. In winter time, I really don't use these a lot myself in the winter time because these mimic the bait fish, the bigger bait fish. And there's not really a lot of that around. It's not what the fish are targeting during the winter time. They're targeting shrimp and crabs and little tiny minnows. So why not give them what you're looking for? A shrimp, a crab, or a minnow? Now uh, you notice all these things have exposed hooks on them, which are going to get me a lot better hookup percentage because as soon as that fish bites, he's biting into the hook, as opposed to something like this, where now I have a nice weedless bait and I can drag this through the grass, but this guy here doesn't get a bit of grass on it, but before that fish gets the hook, he has to depress that plastic and then if he doesn't bite really hard or just in the right way, he doesn't get that hook. So you sacrifice some of your hookup percentage by making yourself a weedless bait. Unless I have big mats of floating grass on the surface, which I haven't seen much in the last couple weeks. It was uh, last month, there was still plenty of that around. But if I don't have that, there's no reason that I can't fish this exposed hook bait anywhere that I fish. But when I'm fishing this, I'm not throwing it out, letting it sink down in the grass, and then dredge it along the bottom, pulling it through the grass, because obviously it's going to get these up. I'm throwing it out, letting it sink down to the top of the grass, and then moving it before it gets buried down in there. So it's being able to learn how to use these things with exposed hook are going to get you a lot better hookup than if you have to use something that's totally weedless. I've caught plenty. I've caught plenty of fish on these weedless baits. I give them to my clients all the time because most of them have a problem using these because they don't fish a whole lot, and especially don't fish in 8, 12, inch, 18 inches of water. They're used to fishing in much deeper water that doesn't have weeds and it really doesn't matter you know, what speed you reel that in. So I can give this to anybody. And they can reel it at any speed and they don't have to worry about them getting grass. But once you can learn to use these, I think you're going to end up having a lot better time sight fishing and, and cooking more fish that you get bites from. Notice that these things are all, also quite small. And if I could throw something even smaller than this that I could cast you know, for any amount of distance or accuracy, I'd probably be willing to use it. Because I do a lot of fly fishing. And we use flies that you know, aren't any bigger than, you know, I would use a fly that's no bigger than this tail right here. I have no problem throwing that to a, a full-size redfish and expecting them to eat it because a lot of the little crabs that they eat are no bigger than that. But uh, obviously we can't throw something that small on spinning tackles, so we're kind of limited. So I use the smallest baits that I can throw reasonably and get to the fish and expect to be able to make a good presentation. If I'm using those little baits, i got to have something those things are you know, they're, they're big by the standards size of the stuff that the fish might be eating. But I still have to be able to throw this on the spin attack bowl. And the only way I'm going to be able to do that with any kind of distance, if I need distance, is by using light line. I don't use anything bigger than 10 pound. Uh, a lot of my wintertime stuff on my personal reels, I'll even use 5 or 6 pound. And uh, you can throw this little shrimp a long way with 6 pound braid. Six pound braid, if you, you put on two or three pounds of drag, you're not gonna have any problem getting in, reeling in redfish in any trout. Would I target the 20 and 30 pound fish on six pound? No, I wouldn't. You 
could catch them on it, but you're going to have to fight them so long it's not going to be good for them. But the average wintertime redfish that you see up on the flats, you have no problem catching those guys at six pound line. And it's a lot of fun too. Put up a good fight, use a little bit lighter rod sometimes, and you can cast that six pound braid a lot. Now, if you're not careful with it, you know, the thicker the braid, the more resistant it is to get in the big old the wind knots that have nothing to do with the wind. But you know, if you put that five pound on here, and you fill it all the way up, and you're not careful and maintain nice tight wraps in this pool, you make, you'll have a big, huge bird nest, a five pound line all tangled up here. But if you're careful with and paying attention to how you reel it in, if you haven't tried that five or six pound line, uh, I recommend you try it because you really find that it casts a lot better. Huge difference between 10 and 20 pound braid. I find 20 pound braid surprising to me, but on the flats, 20 pound seems to be quite popular among people, even the 15. And I've, lot, I've had guys that want to bring their own rods. No problem. If you want to fish with me, you can fish with whatever kind of rod makes you happy. If you want to bring your own, that's great. And they bring they show up with 20 pounds, and I give them one of these to tie it on. And they cast it a few times, and I say, here, try this one with the 10. And then they end up putting theirs down because they find out how much better this cast with 10 pounds on it. Huge difference. And if you, you're not going to break, you know, I, don't have, I don't have any problem with this line breaking on fish. If you put this on a scale, I bet this line doesn't break till 16, 17 pounds. Most of, the, most of your reels that are this size can barely even put that much drag pressure on it if you locked it all the way down. So you know, you're not gonna break the fish off. The drag's gonna start pulling off long before you break the fish off. You know, even, even 10 pounds of drag, if you, if you took this down tighten this down to 10 pounds of drag and try to pull that line off, you'd have a hard time pulling that line off this pool at 10 pounds of drag. So it's not something that you wouldn't have your drag set that tight on a tackle like this. Um, if you're not sure, if you've never tried it, get a scale, you know, tie it on the scale, and have someone hold that scale and you pull, set your drag at different settings to, to and, and see how much, how much it is for five pounds, how much is six pounds, how much is four pounds, you'd be amazed that you think you're pulling a heck of a lot harder than you are. And I, I tend to send my light, you know, I set them by hand, I never use a scale, I just, I just set it by hand, but I always have extra drag right away if I need it. It's right here in this hand. If I, you know, I, I can never, ever think of a time that a fish has taken all the line off my spool. I had a guy, a guy tell me the other day that uh, he just spooled his thing up and uh, someone came by, he was fishing over on the west coast, and someone came by in the boat and somehow his line got hooked on the boat, I don't know if it was around the prop or whatever, because I just had to stand there and watch all my line, you know, 200, 300 yards of braid just go and think, so what you had to do is go like this and pow, the leader would have broke and you saved all your line. Because the weakest point in that system is going to be this knot right here. That's always the first thing that breaks. It's right there. Either. And it's usually right above that knot that I find it breaks. But never have I had a fish take all my line off my spool and watch it get down to the end and break off. I'd grab onto it and stop it before that. But you know, I always have an extra pound or two of drag right here in my finger, and that fish is taken off. I just I have my finger right there, and if I need to add a little bit more, I can let it go right away. If you put too much here, there's nothing you can do. If you can add drag with this hand, and right away you can let go with that drag. So what I'd like to do, and I know some of you have probably seen it, but I see a couple of new guys that may, maybe haven't seen it, so I'll just do it for a couple of minutes. I'd like to come over here to the pool, and I'll show you a couple things about presenting, and what I like to do when I'm presenting. What's the size? You got 10 pound test line. What's the size leader you use? I use 20 pounds. So it's uh, 20 pounds. I, I still use 20 pounds. You could, you could probably get away with 15. Uh, my fly stuff, I use all, all 15 pound. Uh, I used 20 for a couple reasons. One, um, I don't find these fish are really leader shy about it. You know, I, I don't see that that lightening up on there gets me uh, that a lot more bites, and uh, then. If I got people that are a little, a lot of people still don't fish with braided line. You know, everything I fish with is braid. 
a lot of people don't fish for braid and they get like a bass set when you start down here you end up back here over your head and, and uh, that little heavier that heavier leader I don't have to worry about them busting it off quite as easy. Uh, it also gives you a you know, something to grab hold of. Yes. Do you double up on the uh, braid when you're tying that down? Yeah, I always double my braid, and what I found that if you don't, if it doesn't happen to you, I'm surprised, and if it hasn't yet, it probably will. So if you're using 10 pound braid in 15 or 20 pound liter, and you don't double this up somehow, now you don't have to have a double line up here. You can tie a double line like a spider hitch or bimini twist, and then tie this to your double line, or you can just fold the, the end of the line over before you make the knot. But if you don't, this braid is so thin that it, with those single wraps on that leader, a lot of times with pressure on it, it'll cut right through that leader, and that's where this comes apart right at the knot. It seems like you're not broke, but the braid is actually cutting through that leader. So uh, this, uh, that's probably a, a triple surgeons or a double uni. So what are you talking about double on your line? So if you take, if I, if I cut this off, I guess this is that's all right. If I cut this off, and I just, uh, so if this is the end of my braid here, just fold it over, and then tie my knot, and take my leader and tie the knot with a folded over piece of braid. Okay. So I got two strands instead of one. Okay. So you could make a bimini twist or a spider hitch and have this at the end of your line, or you can just fold it over and tie it, pull it tight, and then you got extra pieces to cut it off. Okay. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to dump your line. I mean, sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't, um, but yeah, I always double that, double that over before I'm tying that leader on. How long a leader do you use? On my own stuff, I tend to use a lot shorter leader than I do uh, on my charter rod. This this would this would probably be 12, 10 inches longer, and I would I probably only use something for that long because I don't. Myself, I just don't like having to reel that, that knot in and out of my tip all day. But I just, if I could have a leader about that long, where now I got the perfect amount of line outside my tip, and I don't have to constantly reel that leader in, that knot in and out, in and out of those guides over and over and over. Because um, that's about how much I leave out the cast width. So, and, you know, I know some guys tie a three foot leader on there, but then that leader, just, that knot's just rubbing on those guys every single cast. And, I just don't like it. I don't find that I need it. And I can, I, I've caught way more redfish than I can count with a leader no bigger than that. Because if I'm, if I'm out fishing myself, and I'm you know, just constantly changing lures and playing around, by the end of the day, that leader might only be that big. Caught plenty of fish with that big. Because you, you could probably catch them tying it to the braid a lot of times. But if this little piece of clear stuff got me, even even got me one fish more a month, that's yeah, worth the hassle of me. Have it put it on there. If this is fluorocarbon. If that only gets me five more fish a year, it's, it's worth it to me. You know, for that couple extra cents that it cost me, and uh, you know, it might get me that fish that otherwise wouldn't wouldn't have bit because he didn't like the look of that line, but he, he bit because I had fluorocarbon leader. Any? Yes, sir. I can think of another reason why it's better to have your fluorocarbon. You're tying your uh, loop knot. Yeah, yeah. You it's certainly couldn't to tie. Uh, it's easier to tie the knots. Uh, on, to tie those lures on in the leader too, and to tie a loop on there. Move we'll over your rod real quick. Would you like fishing with the type of rod and the size and everything based on for this particular sight fishing? Yeah, I like something that's at least at a minimum seven foot. I like seven and between seven and seven and a half because you're going to be able to get that longer cast with a light lure uh, a medium action I don't I don't like a, uh, a really soft big long rod because then the tip gets too whippy and it's a little harder to control your cast so I use the I use this rod it's a seven foot four medium fast action I got quite a few of these it, Last to be a long time, caught a lot of fish on them. But uh, the shorter the rod you get, the better it is for skipping up under docks or mangroves, but the, you're really going to sacrifice your distance with light lures if you need it. Now, most, a lot of the fish I catch are, are within 30 feet of the boat. But if I've seen tailing fish and I can reach him at 60 feet, 
instead of having to get 20 or 30 feet from them, there's a lot less chance that fish is going to hear me or see me come. So the farther away I can reach when I need to, or if I have a group of fish that's pushing away and I need to make that Hail Mary cast out in front of them, I want to be able to reach them if I can. And that, that longer rod certainly going to be able to help me do that. All right, well, let's, you guys want to move along to the side of the pool, I'm going to get up on the stage here. I'll, I'll finish up. Yeah. Or, or you can. Thank mm -hmm. you. 